Um, on the, uh, if you're on a, um, a laptop or an iPad, um, towards the bottom, you should have a chat button. And if you just click on that chat button, you will see a chat window open to the right where you can type a message where it says type message here. And I'm going to type in a message right there to the room. So you see I just typed in hello everyone. So if at any point during this presentation you'd like to ask a question, um, feel free to just type in a question there and it will show up and I'll address all those questions between each of the sections of uh, our little presentation today. And we've got, uh, as I said, um, four different sections and, and lots of musical examples. So, um, welcome everyone. I'm so glad you're all here. And uh, without further ado, we will get started on part two of Music's Great Turning Points. Uh, so I'm going to switch over and you won't see me except probably in some small box or something like that. I don't really know what it looks like for all of you. So here we go. So uh, Music's Great Turning Points Part 2 today will begin with this handsome devil, uh, Ludwig van Beethoven, who many of you know will be celebrating his 250th birthday this December. And uh, we haven't officially announced it yet, uh, but this coming season features a great deal of Beethoven. Um, and we're going to be making an announcement very soon uh, about the music of the coming season. But I can tell you that Beethoven will be represented on every concert this coming season. Uh, the reason we're starting with Beethoven today uh, is um, th there is most definitely a line uh, before and after Beethoven that can be clearly seen in in music history and there really isn't a composer living today still who isn't affected by the legacy of Beethoven. Um, now when we think of uh, classical symphonies how many of you if I say think of a classical symphony composer um, just answer for yourselves how many of you think of Mozart first or maybe you think of Haydn first, or maybe you think of Beethoven first. Um, there are some that consider Beethoven the first romantic composer. Um, I don't typically, I do tend to think of him as the very tail end of the classical era. However, he certainly did usher in a lot of the ideas of romanticism and was affected by um, romanticism that was very much on the way already. Um, the, the main, um, the main um, genre uh, that orchestral musicians like myself tend to think of when it comes to Beethoven, Beethoven wrote concerti and he wrote tons of string quartets, amazing string quartets. He wrote one uh, phenomenal monumental opera, Fidelio, um, but for most of us, the, the one genre overall that shines out as something that he changed everything about was the symphony. Um, and it's not just the scope of the symphony, but also the whole idea and concept of writing a symphony at all changed as a result of Beethoven. So first, uh, we'll, we'll talk about symphonic durations. Now, in, in Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven's time, uh, the late 18th century, there were quite literally hundreds of composers who were earning a living, um, most of them um, uh, composing symphonies. So there are literally thousands uh, of symphonies that were composed in Vienna during the 18th century. And when you think about that, I mean, try to think of how many composers can you even mention? I can tell you a few of the prominent ones, and let's take a look at how many symphonies they wrote. So Haydn, um, well, yeah, let's, I'm going to skip ahead of this one. So Haydn lived 77 years, wrote 104 symphonies in that time, Mozart 35, in only 35 years of living. Now granted, he was composing for about 30 years out of those 35, but still uh, wrote 41 symphonies. Um, and it goes on, Dittersdorf, Karl Dittersdorf is not a name that that many 
Uh, it's certainly not a household name these days, but he's a composer who wrote some wonderful symphonies and wrote over 120 of them. And then the last, Johann Stamitz, who actually uh, greatly affected the symphonies of, of Mozart. He was a huge influence to him, wrote over 20 symphonies as well, uh, somewhere around 22, but it depends on what counts as a symphony and what doesn't for some of those works. Now, Beethoven, in 56 years, only composed nine symphonies. In his last symphony, the ninth, he spent 14 years alone perfecting that symphony. Um, now, we, we generally think of that as having been written over a period of two years, but I'm going to show you how um, the early parts of him working on that one symphony actually went back 14 years. He was working on it forever. And then notice the difference of symphony, symphonic composers after Beethoven. Mendelssohn only wrote four symphonies. Now, there are also 12 string symphonies that Mendelssohn wrote uh, during his teenage years, but full symphonies, there's only four. No, five. Sorry, they should have said five. I can't stand it. I'm a perfectionist. There, okay. Now it's correct. <laughs> Schubert wrote nine symphonies in, in his 31 years. Sadly, Schubert never heard one of his symphonies performed during his lifetime. And then Brahms, living a full 64 years, only composed four symphonies, four incredible symphonies. And his first, he did not even compose until he was 40 years old. Much of this is because of the heavy footsteps of Beethoven that were behind all of these composers. There was such a high bar that was set. So when all of these composers, Haydn, Mozart, Didesdorf, Stamets, and the others were composing symphonies, these were meant as, as light works. Um, the symphony as a form grew out of uh, two earlier forms in the Baroque era those being the Baroque Dance Suite and Opera Overtures. Now, the Baroque Dance Suite was initially, um, it could be anywhere from four to six movements typically, but these were actually, you know, orchestral accompaniment for dancing. And as a result, you would, uh, to, to aid dancers, they would have um, a fast movement and then a slow movement and a fast movement and a slow movement. And this juxtaposition of fast against slow gave people a break between fast dances. And this tradition of fast, slow, fast, slow carried over when uh, they started developing these into a larger form. And to this day, uh, symphonies as we know them are very much fast, slow. There's a minuet and trio, the minuet coming right out of those dance suites. And of course, uh, the finale being a, a fast movement. Uh, the other genre that symphonies grew out of was opera overtures, which in some parts of Europe were actually called sinfonias. And these were often, these weren't played um, just as an introduction to an opera. It was also just to alert the audience that, hey, the show's about to begin because they didn't have electronic bells and they couldn't make the candles flicker on and off. The only way they would know the opera was about to begin was by having some kind of musical interlude. And these, uh, these overtures became longer and longer and more dramatic works. Um, and then became popular enough that they would be performed in their own right. And between these two genres, the symphony was born. And it was really Franz Joseph Haydn that brought the symphony uh, into its maturity over the course of the 104 symphonies that he wrote. Now, let's talk about durations. Uh, symphonies before Beethoven were generally considered a lighter work, an entertainment, maybe something during the background. Uh, it could be something that was performed at a court celebration as background music or maybe a dinner entertainment. Um, but it was, it was a light work. You know, Haydn uh, would write a symphony over the course of a couple of days. And not all of his symphonies are brilliant. I'm, uh, one musicologist, um, uh, Howard Goodman, I believe, said that uh, many of Haydn's symphonies do have a by-the-yard uh, quality to them. And as, as in, you know, how long do you need? 20 minutes? Okay, it's a 20-minute symphony that he wrote. Of course, many of them are brilliant and uh, have stood the test of time and are, are performed frequently. Um, one of his early symphonies of uh, the first 10 is Sunrise that depicts a sunrise and um, 
the Farewell Symphony is, is obviously well known as is the Surprise Symphony and then his London symphonies being the last several he composed. Anyway, the point being, throughout the course of his symphonies, the average duration of his symphonies is 20 to 25 minutes. C.P.E. Bach, the most famous of Bach's sons, his first symphony is 11 minutes, and that was about the standard for him. Even Mozart's great G minor symphony isn't even a half hour long. And likewise, Beethoven's first symphony was very much on the Haydn model. Uh, Haydn was uh, one of Beethoven's teachers. Um, and the first symphony is certainly Haydn-esque. Now, what happened here between these symphonies? Because the symphony number two is, is actually along the same model as symphony number one. It's a relatively short work. However, um, in 1802, Beethoven was in Heiligestad. And there's a famous um, letter that he wrote that we now realize he, he, it was a, we believe it was originally conceived probably as a suicide note. Um, Beethoven was absolutely bereft and uh, ultimately wrote this letter that is now called the Heilige Stadt Testament to his brothers where he was confessing to them and apologizing to them for being so withdrawn and growing ever more withdrawn. And he was confessing to them that the reason for all of this was because of his oncoming deafness. And this, uh, one of the things he says in that letter is that um, the one sense of his that should be stronger than any other because of his, uh, the fact of his being a musician and a composer, this one sense that should be stronger than any other is the one that's failing him. And he lamented how he would, you know, go on walks in the countryside with people and somebody might point out hearing, you know, a horn call in the distance or bird song, and that he would just smile and nod, but he couldn't hear it and he couldn't take part in the enjoyment of these sounds. And the only sounds he could enjoy were the ones that were inside him. But he did feel uh, the call of destiny and this, he really did feel destined to bring about a change in music and to bring about, bring about a new voice and a new kind of, uh, of artistic work. And it was this that kept him going. And the first example of this is his Symphony Eroica, the third symphony. The first movement alone of this symphony is about 25 minutes long. So the first movement alone has such a long development period in that first symphony, and it's as long as most prior symphonies that were written. Uh, and the second movement also, like 17 minutes long. It's, it's a massive work. Um, and for that period, it was particularly noticeable what a different work this was in the context of what had come before. And his symphonies that followed were, uh, many of which were, were along those same lines. Um, one of the things that changed in the way that Beethoven composed symphonies, it wasn't simply in duration, it was also uh, the very idea of composing a symphony. Um, he, would, uh, he would introduce a cyclicality to his symphonies um, in a way that made all of the movements interrelated. Um, Hector Berlioz would, would build on this idea in what we now know as uh, a technique called ide fixe, or a fixed idea, an obsession maybe a motive that connects all of the movements, different parts of the work. Um, the most memorable example of this, most obvious example, of course, is, is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. So we only need to hear those first four notes, bum, 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 three fast notes, dropping a minor third to a slower note. The entire symphony is composed out of those four notes. And this idea is held and expounded and expanded on and varied through four whole movements. It connects every part of the symphony. And I'm gonna uh, give you a couple of examples of how that happened. So in the first movement, it's rather obvious because it, the idea is pounded into submission throughout the whole thing. In the second movement, it's a little less apparent, but I'm gonna play a couple examples for you and show you how he developed that idea over the course of the second movement. And it's a little more subtle, but here's the first example. Mm -hmm. 
There is a repetition of three to one throughout the second movement all over the place. And it, it repeats right after this. And how many times does it repeat? Three times. How does the symphony end? Uh, actually, let me see if that moment comes here. So this movement ends with a similar idea. Bum, 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 two, three, one. It's a double use of this same theme. And what follows right after that? He's taken that bum, 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 bum. He's turned it upside down. And instead of three notes, it's a note lasting three beats. One, two, three, one. So that's how he uses it in this movement. So how does he use that theme in the third movement? Well, it's pretty obvious. You'll hear it in the horn call about 20 seconds in. This is the true genius of what uh, Beethoven introduced, the idea of taking a small kernel of an idea and exploding it into 45 minutes of music. This idea of ultimate development of ideas is, uh, was a groundbreaking idea. Um, the idea that so much music could be generated from such small pieces. And in my mind, this even looks ahead to 20th century minimalism. So let's look at the last movement, and I want to show you just two examples of how he uses this idea there. So it begins with this fanfare, of course. Which represents the first theme of the last movement. And the second theme of the last movement. One, two, three, one, one, two, three, one, one, two, three, one. It's everywhere, this theme. And then at the very end, he finally brings back a version of the very beginning. Ba -ba -ba -bum, ba -ba -ba -bum. And it's so fast, it's almost imperceptible. Right there. Ba -ba -ba -bum. Ba -ba -ba -bum. It's extraordinary. And this is these are the kinds of ideas uh, when when composers of the era uh, came to grips with what Beethoven had done. It, it just exploded the possibilities of what a symphony can do. And the gauntlet had been dropped at this point. Anybody who was going to write a symphony was going to be compared to Beethoven pretty much from then on. Um, it's, it's known that the first time uh, the symphony number no. five was performed at the Paris Conservatory, Berlioz was in the audience. And he quickly got a copy of the score and poured through it for weeks and months. And you know, he said it was almost as if his hair was on fire. It so changed his idea of what a symphony could do.
Another beautiful example of uh, the compositional process is with uh, the Symphony Number no. 9. Uh, with Beethoven's Great Ninth Symphony, for many the greatest symphony ever written, certainly the greatest symphony of the 19th century, uh, in my mind. Um, he actually gives us a glimpse into his own compositional mind as the last movement begins. Now to understand this, uh, we need to listen to the themes and, and uh, keep a kind of a mental bookmark of what each of the, f the main themes sound like to the first three movements. So let's go over those really quick. They're actually very simple and easy to commit to memory very quickly. So here's the first movement of Beethoven 9. this is really is taking perfect intervals, uh, the, the perfect intervals that go all the way back to the time of Pythagoras, and lining them up in opposite directions. So we have the winds outlining these on the way up. They're adding one at a time, just up a fifth, up a fourth, and perfect intervals coming down. ba dum ba dum ba dum That's all you need to remember. Second movement, or the second movement, which in this case he inverts fast and slow, so the second movement is the fast movement. Easy enough to remember. And the third movement. One of the most gorgeous movements ever written. Let's listen to the, the, the absolutely uh, heart-rendingly beautiful theme. So, we have these first three movements, and as Beethoven begins his last movement, which is variations on a theme, and includes a chorus for the first time in a symphony, it's as if he's searching, what is the theme going to be for this theme and variations? And you can hear him searching to prior points in the piece. So what you'll hear um, is an explosion uh, from the very beginning, as if it's Beethoven himself, you know, trying to find what this theme is, as if it's something he's searching for. And then we hear a dialogue in the cellos. It's basically operatic recitative. There's a dialogue in the cellos. And at the end of each little cello interlude of recitative, he tries out a theme and rejects it. Then he tries out another theme and rejects it and tries out another theme. The first theme he tries is a theme from the first movement. Then he comes back and he tries the theme from the second movement and then it's rejected. Then he tries the theme from the third movement and again it's rejected and then finally the theme we all know. So listen to the introduction of this. <laughs> 
Here's the first shot at a theme for the for the variations. Is this going to be it? start to hear the beginning of what will become the great theme of the fourth movement, which comes in just a moment, but I'm going to play a later uh, expanded version of this just because it's easier to hear. So as we all know, the theme we've come to know and love is this. this theme come from? Well, if you look on Wikipedia, or most textbooks, they will list Beethoven's years of working on the Ninth Symphony as 1822 to 1824. This is utter nonsense. He'd been working on that piece, that theme, for easily for 14 years. And the best way to demonstrate it is to go back to a work he wrote in, when did he write this? 1808. The same year that he wrote the 6th and 7th symphonies, he also happened to write this little ditty for piano, chorus, and, and vocal soloists. And I'm going to play you a part. Hold on just a moment. It is a beautiful example of a composer taking earlier material and reworking it for later use. <laughs> So this work, the Choral Fantasy from 1808, 14 years later, could easily be mistaken if you weren't paying attention. It could be mistaken for something from Beethoven's Ninth. This melody is literally just a scale up and down, just like the melody. Bum, ba, da, 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 da. And there's a note that he hangs on, on the second note. Bum, ba, da, da. The only variation he makes with his, uh, with his theme for the Ninth Symphony is he goes up two steps before making that. Ba, da, 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 da. But it's otherwise just a simple scale up and down. Which, the most similar part to what we just heard is about here. Right 
So the reason I'm pointing this out is not just to point out the incredible genius of Beethoven, although that alone would be worth it. It's more to point out that these pieces Haydn was composing, you know, he would throw off in a couple of days, maybe in one day, Mozart could have a whole symphony in his head and just write it down like he was taking transcription from an earlier thought. Um, Beethoven was brooding over this idea for 14 years, reworking these ideas. Um, and part of the reason he did this was because Beethoven was one of the first composers who was writing for posterity. He was writing for the future. He was writing music that would stand the test of time. And this is the other great change that Beethoven made. Composers before Beethoven were not really considered to be artists. They were considered to be more like craftsmen. And this is even true of Mozart, although in his very late period this did start to change. Um, however, so take your, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, for example. Now we know today that Bach is uh, arguably the greatest mind, uh, compositional mind that ever lived. He's, he's like a musical Einstein. Um, and maybe on a different talk we can get into why. Um, but what he was able to do is, is it, it staggers the mind. He was truly a genius. Well, poor Johann Sebastian Bach spent uh, roughly 27 years, the last 27 years of his life, in this church, which is St. Thomas Church. And for most of the late years of his life, he was hardly known outside of Leipzig one of the greatest composers who ever lived, hardly known at all. Three of his sons, especially C.P.E. Bach, were known all over Europe, uh, and they were much more famous than uh, their father. Um, Bach, of course, was tasked not only with writing cantatas for church services, for feast days, uh, for any, uh, any service throughout the whole liturgical year, he'd be writing new music for these events. Um, but the poor man was also tasked with um, waking up school children every day and making sure that all of these uh, students were up and getting to their breakfasts and, and was teaching them music and all these menial tasks um, you know that would that any school teacher would normally follow this is stuff he had to find time to do in addition to writing hundreds and hundreds of works every single year not only that we have such evidence um, that shows us that Bach's music was not written for posterity. Uh, he really didn't intend for anyone except the people of Leipzig and the people of the congregation necessarily um, to be terribly aware of his music. And we know this because his wife would use old pieces that he was no longer performing as gift wrap uh, or to wrap food. Um, there would be a piece lying around a cantata, and uh, his wife might ask him, you know, are, are you using this? Like, no, we performed that cantata two weeks ago. You can have it. And she would take pieces of it and wrap gifts in it and send it off. And we've actually lost a great deal of his work in this manner because it was not preserved in any way. Um, Franz Joseph Haydn, another example. So Haydn uh, spent... Um, all, almost all of his mature career. It was only in the very last couple of years of his career that he wasn't in the permanent service of the Esterhazy family. And most of that, uh, Nicholas II, Prince Esterhazy, was, was a great patron of his, but nevertheless, he was a servant of the Esterhazy family. And almost all of his output was specific uh, to that family and events of theirs. And then, of course, Mozart. Now, this is obviously not really Mozart, but he's who most of us have come to think of as Mozart. Uh, Mozart, uh, his actual born name was not Amadeus. It was Johannes Chrysostomus Wolfgangus Theophilus Mozart. And Amadeus was a nickname that was given to him while he was on tour with his father, Amadeus from God. Um, so Mozart, for most of his career, uh, was in the employ of, of two people. First was Sigismund von Schrattenbach, who was Archbishop of Salzburg, where Mozart was from. And when, once he was in Vienna, of course, it was Emperor Joseph II. Um, he didn't work specifically for Emperor Joseph II. Um, however, the, uh, he wrote many court operas um, uh, for the National Opera. Um, uh, yeah, National Operas for the National Opera, which was um, all 
commissioned by Emperor Joseph. And then Beethoven comes along and Beethoven decides um, he's not going to be servant to anyone. Now this, this quote of his, I like to unhorse good writers. Um, there's a lot of great quotes with Beethoven, but he, he was constantly pushing against authority of any kind. Um, once concertmaster of an orchestra at that time would basically be the conductor the leader of the orchestra complained to him that his music was difficult and it was almost as if it was written in such a way that it was meant to mess players up rhythmically and his reply was I like to unhorse good writers. <laughs> um, there was uh, also a, a, a patron of his, uh, Prince Karl Lichnowsky, uh, who had suggested that Beethoven, uh, it, it might be appropriate for him to uh, to be a little more comfortable with his station uh, and maybe to adopt uh, a bit more humility. And Beethoven's reply was, and this was in a letter, so we actually have this in Beethoven's own hand, Prince, what are you? What you are, you are by accident of birth. What I am, I am of myself. There are and will be thousands of princes. There is only one Beethoven. So Beethoven really did have in mind that he was writing for the future. And he did, to this day, uh, any composer writing a symphony um, has to think back uh, about what they can do that's even worthy of being called a symphony. That's the end of part one. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, I'm gonna look at the chat here and see what we might have. I'm gonna unmute everybody and Good. So if anybody wants to ask a question, now's your chance. And then we'll cover his preparing choral fantasy for March 22nd. Oh, that's fan. Oh. So yeah. Wacom Corral was preparing the choral fantasy. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah. Oh, well. We'll all make music again. Mm -hmm. Michael? Yes, dear. Um, do you know when um, Beethoven kind of busted the, the time frames of symphonies with his third symphony, right? Yeah, yes. third symphony. Was, was there pushback from the audience? Were they saying, wow, this is, or did they say, this is, this is awesome? Or did they feel that, oh my God, this is really yeah. a lot more it, than usual? <laughs> like, like many artists, it was, it was split. There were those who thought he was a genius, and there were those who thought he'd really gone around the band. <laughs> that, you know, that this man is, you know, just nuts. Um, and I mean, people were so, I mean, it was, it was obvious to everyone that um, <laughs> was a genius and maybe was adopting, um, you know, was the next great genius after Mozart. And he was kind of following in this line of, of great genius composers. Um, but yeah, there were plenty who thought that he was going off in, in his own direction and that nobody could follow. But as Beethoven demonstrated, he really didn't care uh, that for those that, that couldn't understand his music. Um, there were plenty of composers who were you know, learned and understood what he was doing. And, and uh, there were enough that um, he had regular patrons. And enough of his symphonies were well received. Uh, enough of his works in general, they were well enough received that he was still constantly getting uh, commissions for new works. Um, there were enough people that got it. You know, so he did have a, a strong enough following. It wasn't like Schubert, for example. Um, Schubert's nine symphonies, none of them were heard during his lifetime. He never got to hear one of his own <laughs> symphonies. Um, it was mainly through salons and parties and chamber music. And this is why Schubert wrote hundreds and hundreds of songs. I think there's over 800 art songs that Schubert wrote because that's how he made a living. He was publishing music all over the place. He didn't have any patron. Uh, that day was over. At this point, composers were now artists after Beethoven, and they had to kind of make their own way. And like most artists of the 19th century, a lot of them weren't appreciated until after they were long gone. Steve, I just want to say, Steve speculating that there might have been a breakthrough in upholstery about then. Softer chairs, people could sit longer. <laughs> yeah, maybe. maybe. I mean, there's certainly that was the beginning of a rise of a of a middle class 
uh, appreciator of music. Concert halls were starting to be built. Public opera houses were being built. All of this happened in, in the 18th and early 19th century. And the whole idea of music for the public and not just for the aristocracy, um, this was exploding all over the place. Piano production, um, these small pianos that could be built for the home were being constructed all over Europe. Um, and the idea that you could make music yourself, this is what made careers like Schubert's possible. He was writing you know, all of these art songs. These weren't written for aristocracy. These were written, written for people just like you and me who wanted something to perform in their house. And it's no different than having a stereo system or access to Netflix for us today. Back then, they would buy a new song by Schubert that everybody loved and they would perform it together. Thank you. Yeah, yeah of course. Um, okay, I'm, well, any other questions? Yeah. I'm wondering about the relationship uh, between the symphonies and the quartets, like the, the late Beethoven quartets that are so difficult to even understand. How did that fit yeah. in? Yeah, there are even some, uh, there are even some, the, the, la the very last work um, Beethoven was working on was the Grosse Fuga, um, which is just, it he actually what's amazing is during Beethoven's time and Mozart's time and even Haydn's time before, they all looked back on J.S. Bach as being this very old fashioned counterpoint composer who was writing this cerebral style of music. What was Beethoven doing in his very last days? He was experimenting with all kinds of dense counterpoint and it was like Bach counterpoint, but um, translated through uh, the harmonic language of Beethoven's late works. So in many ways, his string quartets became a workshop for advanced ideas. And what you'll find is if you line up when he was writing his string quartets and when he was writing his symphonies, um, he was usually playing with compositional ideas in smaller works first. And then he would expound on those ideas in symphonies later. Um, in many ways, uh, the, the string quartets get much more compositionally dense and complicated than any of his symphonies. But you know, to write a work that complicated at that time, that's like writing a Mahler symphony. I mean, they're, in, they're so intricate. There's so much going on. And frankly, orchestras at that time would never have been able to handle it. If you got four great string players together in that era, then you could do a decent performance of one of his string quartets. But you couldn't get a group. Um, mm -hmm. In those days, you know, an orchestra maybe would have one or two, maybe three rehearsals to do a premiere. And Beethoven's oh. premieres were hard. They were really hard works to perform back then. I mean, they're not easy to perform now. Exactly. You know, but I mean, my orchestra, we take six weeks to prepare a concert. Mm -hmm. it, even the Seattle Symphony, if they're performing, you know, a symphony of Brahms or, or Beethoven, and these are works they've performed hundreds of times, they will still rehearse them for days to get mm -hmm. a performance out of them. But you know, that was not expected back then because they were still thinking like Haydn and Mozart, oh, we can just sight read this stuff. This is why a lot of composers were, comp or a lot of players were complaining when they were playing Beethoven's music because they actually had to practice. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you. So with that, let's move on. I'm gonna mute everybody again. And we're gonna go on to one of my absolute favorite composers to talk about. Um, so very often throughout music history, we find that some of the greatest innovators are not necessarily the greatest composers, but they manage to change everything nonetheless. And Franz Liszt is one of these composers. Uh, Franz Liszt, I, I've called him here the ultimate trendsetter. He set a number of trends that one after another set the pace and the structure of ideas and inspiration for countless composers that was to follow. And Liszt is hardly a, a household name like Beethoven or Mozart. Um, and his compositions, frankly, are not as good. But it's the kind of compositions and just the amazing innovation of ideas. The fact that he was first to do so many things is what uh, makes him uh, arguably the most important influence of the late 19th century, of the second half of the 19th century. Um, 
So one of the first innovations way back in about 1838 was the introduction of the macabre into music. Um, at this point, uh, up in 1838, it was still relatively unusual to, to have such dark imagery and macabre ideas in music. Um, but uh, Liszt came along with this very cool idea in his Dance of Death, which uses the dies irae, the dies irae being the chant for the dead, bom, 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 from which he composed his Totentons, Dance of the Dead. There's this incredible theatricality in his, in his playing that was terribly uncommon at that time. And it was just exploding off the stage, which was very much Liszt's style. Well, this, was, this caught on, and other composers started to mimic this idea. So Totentanz was, was written and developed between 1838 and 1849 when it was finally published. Um, but the more macabre things that we've come to know really came much later. So if you consider uh, the Danse Macabre of Saint-Saëns, which we'll listen to a couple of these really quick. This is, of course, very well known. More well known than Liszt. just realized I don't think I've shared the screen so you can't see all my cool slides. Let's go back to that. Okay, there we are. So this was, here's Franz Liszt, the ultimate trends letter as a handsome young man. And getting into our macabre music. So Totentanz from 1849. And these are you know, other works from far later dates, as, I, as we were about to mention. So the first being Saint-Saëns' Danse Macabre. Another example, Grieg's March of the Trolls. Rachmaninoff, of course, was interested in this, not only in general, uh, the idea of macabre, and Rachmaninoff was rather obsessed with death. And the Dies Irae, this uh, uh, psalm of death, um, became an obsession of his throughout his whole career. We'll get to Isle of the Dead in a little bit. Now, second major innovation of Franz Liszt's was uh, that of spectacle and virtuosity in performance. Uh, this pencil sketch you see is from a piano recital he gave. Now, the whole idea of a piano recital uh, in this fashion was completely new, and Liszt was the one to do it. Uh, this, right now, if you go to a piano recital, we're used to seeing the piano turned on its side like this, so that the piano is oblong, um, parallel to the front row of the audience, but that's not how it used to be. Um, it would be turned the other way and the composer would be more or less looking at the audience. But he wanted people to be able to see his hands flying up and down the keyboards. Uh, and he used to wear these white gloves. And at the end of the performance, he would take off his gloves and fling them into the audience to all of his adoring fans. It was more like, you know, a Beatles concert in the Edison, in, uh, in the, the, what is it, Sullivan Theater than it was um, any calm, rational performance we would expect to sit in uh, in any classical uh, recital today. People were going absolutely mad. Now, Liszt not only would program his own works, 
at these recitals, but he would also be promoting other works. He would play, he was in Paris for most of this time. He would play works of Chopin and helped to, um, uh, to bring about a love of Chopin's preludes. Um, and he also is very much responsible for Berlioz's Symphony Fantastique having the success it did. Symphony Fantastique of Berlioz, one of the most important works of the early uh, 19th century, um, the first time it was played, it was rather a disastrous re uh, reception, but Liszt recognized it was genius. So he wrote a piano reduction of this work, and he started performing it at salons and recitals um, and explaining what a spectacular piece this was and how much fun it was. And as a result of this, when Berlioz finally uh, was able to scratch together the funds to do another orchestral performance, it was very well received indeed. And here's another late photograph, um, the actual photograph uh, from a very old list performing uh, for another adoring crowd. So there, oh, another thing that's very interesting. If you look, you can actually see in this photograph, it's an iron frame that's inside this piano. List is very much responsible for that being necessary. Works like Totentons would just wreak havoc on early 19th century pianos. And he had turned this into an instrument of, of orchestral operatic scale. And the drama of that kind of playing really facilitated a piano that could take a beating. And by the late 19th century, uh, instruments like this, that have this iron framework inside, um, were finally developed. It, they would um, allow for a higher tension string that could ring more and harder hammers that could be struck and the whole thing uh, could resonate more. Uh, piano before this era, if you added up all the tension on this string, the amount of force that's actually pulled from this end of the piano to the back before this iron framework, it was about 10 tons of force. That's uh, those, the front and the back, all those strings pulling the piano. By the late 19th century, with these iron frameworks, they were able to increase the tension on the strings, making larger strings that could ring more, and the total force that's exerted on that instrument that's being held back by these iron frames is over 30 tons. And every modern piano, a grand piano that we use throughout the 20th century is of that design. The third innovation, musical impressionism. Now, I'm, I'm willing to bet if I ask any of you to name an impressionist composer, most of people are going to say Claude Debussy, or maybe Maurice Ravel, or maybe Eric Satie, or Faure, but long before those guys, uh, Franz Liszt was again setting a new trend. So way back in 1874 was when the first of the impressionist exhibitions took place. And this painting, of course, made a gigantic splash. Uh, Impressions Sunrise by Monet. And this was in the 1874 um, exhibition. And this by Manet. It was not part of that first exhibition, but it also from 1875, this one, I believe, uh, the Manet. And this is um, Impressions of a Canal in Venice. And uh, Liszt was so caught up by this idea and so inspired by it that just two years later, in 1877, I think Debussy was maybe three years old at this time, <laughs> he writes this work, which is entitled Fountains at the Villa d'Este. <laughs> This idea of musical impressionism is born. There's no themes here. It's just a flowing of arpeggios, page after page. 
Debussy looked back on these works as being incredibly important to what he would write. And it was actually um, 26 years later, I believe, 1903, when Debussy would write uh, his Gardens in the Rain. If anybody asks you who are who are the big impressionist composers, if that discussion ever comes up, uh, you can show them all up by talking about Franz Liszt. He beat them all to the punch again. The next great idea, and I could probably go through a list of about a dozen. I'm only picking out my favorite five. But the next great idea that was started by Liszt was the symphonic poem. Now he called it the symphonic poem. Um, today we most often refer to these as tone poems. But the whole idea of, a, of literally telling a story through music. So not referring to a story, but literally the music itself is reenacting and coloring and telling the progress of a story in linear time. Um, he saw this as a potential um, alternative to a symphony broken up into multiple movements. Well, rather than breaking something up into a movement, what if we actually had one whole cohesive work? And he started working on these way back in 1848. Now, the most famous composer we know of today for writing a tone poems is Richard Strauss. But we see how long, it was 40 years later that Strauss was writing his tone poems, four decades later. Um, and these works are still, I mean, there were 13 different uh, tone poems or symphonic poems that Liszt composed. Most of them are not really in the, uh, the standard repertory anymore. Um, Prometheus is sometimes performed, Le Prelude is frequently performed, um, whereas all of these are in the standard repertoire except maybe November Woods. Um, and I think I have a few examples of these. Yes, I did want to play uh, a late tone poem for you. This is Isle of the Dead uh, by Rachmaninoff. So what's happening here? Isle of the Dead is based on a painting uh, that refers to the, the Greek myth um, of uh, Greek mythology of Charon rowing a dead, uh, a, a departed soul across the river Styx uh, to the Isle of the Dead. And the river Styx is, is a relatively shallow body of water. And the way Charon would row them is with you know one of those long poles. So he'd be lifting the pole up and down and the way uh, Rachmaninoff depicted this in the music is by writing music that's not in three or four, but in five, five beats per measure, which is uncommon. But what you end up with is one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. It's easier to pull that pole out of the water than to put it down. And that's what the music sounds like. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> 
obsessed with Rachmaninoff. My doctoral work was on Rachmaninoff. So if any of you want to have dinner sometime or lunch and talk about Rachmaninoff, it'll probably go for hours, so be prepared. Um, another work I'll, I'll introduce you to that's a favorite of mine is uh, a late tone poem. Um, this, well, it's a late tone poem of Arnold Bax. Arnold Bax is another composer that's not well known. He was a contemporary and good friend of Edward Elgar and Vaughn Williams. And frankly, he was a better orchestrator than either of them. Um, his orchestrations are just lush and amazing. Here's an example of it that I think actually sounds like you know, soundtracks from Danny Elfman would have made to Batman or something. Uh, it's an amazing color he was doing. Uh, this, I think, way back in 1917. Yeah, same year of The Firebird by Stravinsky. So this idea of telling stories with music, not only did this inspire many later uh, writers of tone poems who were looking for something other than symphonies to write too, um, it also, I think, very much set the stage for what would become film music. Um, all of, most of, of Liszt's tone poems begin with kind of a fanfare splash and it's as if the curtains are being pulled and the show is about to start and it's a lot like the way all of Cecil D. B. DeMille's movies began and a perfect example of this is let's compare the beginning of Franz Liszt's of Prometheus now this tone poem is from 1855 drama. There's a story being told here. You're absolutely pulled right in. And if you think this sounds reminiscent of Wagner, you're not wrong. Wagner not only ripped off lots of these ideas, um, Wagner really owes a great deal to Liszt. So much so that Wagner eventually became his son-in-law. <laughs> I believe uh, Liszt actually was Wagner's best man at his wedding. Um, uh, in addition to, you know, allowing his daughter to marry Wagner. Um, good, and then to compare that, why don't we compare that to Spartacus by Alex North. You know, it's showtime. It's, it's the same idea of storytelling in music. Um, and all of this style of uh, early film music, um, music in the first half and maybe through 1960s, even the 70s, uh, this was very much the style of film scores uh, for that era. And certainly carried through to John Williams, um, who is the last of a great uh, and a, a very impressive line of film composers. Uh, the last area I want to talk about uh, that uh, Liszt was very much ahead of the curve on was uh, folk music inspired orchestral showpieces. This was another idea that he started way back uh, in the mid 19th century that caught on and continued throughout um, the uh, through to the end of the 20th century. So uh, the most well-known work of his that you'll recognize if any of you have ever watched a Bugs Bunny cartoon. 
writer, Dvorak would answer with his own Slavonic dances, originally written for piano four hands instead of just two hands. I think that, well, we'll get there in a minute. see an announcement in a couple weeks about next season that one's going to sound familiar uh, and this by Brahms also written for piano four hands for two players I think Dvorak and, and Brahms maybe they needed four hands to do what Liszt managed to do with only two inspired piece now in 1880 with Grieg. So that is the end of this section on list. So if there are any questions um, about Franz Liszt or any of these other composers, um, I would love to entertain some of those now. Let's see, we can see your screen. Go ahead and fix that. Any questions about list or tone poems or I don't know, piano works? No. I gotta stand up for a minute. Do you want to stand up? Mm. Okay. All right, well, if there's no questions, um, I'll tell you what, why don't we take a five minute break? Good idea. Okay, let's take five minutes and then we'll continue on. Uh, the next two subjects are pretty short, but I want to give you a minute to, to relax, get a glass of water or something. Um, there's probably only about 20 minutes left. Okay, so I will be back in five minutes and we'll see you all very soon. They don't always look as presentable <laughs> as they are now. I would say that they would her over. They have Thank you. 
So, I guess we'll wait till a few more folks come back. We're back. Come back, everyone. Time to start class. <laughs> <laughs> Typical students. Um, I don't know, Michael, if you read the saga of our cruise that never ended. Um, yeah. When, when Steve and I were on the cruise that never ended, there was a lecturer on there who was meant to give two or three lectures to geologists. And he ended up having class every day. We had a geology lecture or oceanography wow. for, a for, a, for a month. That would be the last two weeks every day. And it was just, we continued our lifelong learning. He called us his lifelong learners. But I could do this every day. If you could just, you know, whip up a little hour of class every day, that's great. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't say that I could do it every day. Um, I, I, I would need an assistant. I need a graduate assistant or two to help me assemble material. Right. No, um, it's a lot of work. One a week. One a week I can handle. <laughs> um, all this is so we did have one question here. Uh, what was List's personal life like? His personality, was he a heart throb? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, I personally, one of the first papers I wrote in my doctoral work was about um, List's life and the evolution of his music. Um, uh, as a, a composer in Paris and his interactions with uh, Chopin and Berlioz. Um, you know, he gets a bad rap from history. He's generally considered a bit of a womanizer and um, although there may be some evidence um, that, you know, he was um, playing the field, uh, that he was a playboy, um, there's actually a lot of evidence that that perhaps you know history has uh, colored that idea of him far too much. Um, he was married to a woman that was introduced to him uh, by uh, uh, Chopin and Georges Sand. Um, this this woman was uh, it made his life difficult to say the least. Um, she was she was not all there, and uh, it was it was a rather torturous life uh, he had as far as his marriage life was concerned, and it did create problems with his frequent touring. Um, but you know there there really isn't there's scant evidence at best, um, you know that that he was the womanizer that history portrays him as. And as a matter of fact, um, late in his life he even took uh, took orders and became an ordained priest. So. Um, and his late works are actually very religious in nature. Um, so while I have no doubt that his sensationalized performance um, was was very much meant to be just that, uh, sensationalized um, and meant to provoke um, a lot of enthusiasm about his performances and to help his career, um, he, he seems to have been an enormously generous soul. Um, and there were a lot of composers uh, that he was a patron of and a supporter of and uh, was constantly introducing people to his publisher and uh, there was a lot of composers, successful composers, Chopin and Berlioz among them uh, that really owe uh, a lot of their uh, public success to Franz Liszt to say nothing of the ideas he came up with. Okay, well, uh, if there are no other questions, um, I'll continue to two more brief uh, little things to share. And I'm willing to bet these might raise some questions. We'll see. It'll be interesting. These are fun. Okay, so I'm muting everybody and I'll share my screen and we shall continue. Uh, we'll press on. So the next composer we're talking about today is Gustav Mahler, the father of shh. And the reason I say that is because um, there's a lot of things we could attribute Mahler to. Um, he wrote nine absolutely monumental symphonies uh, and, um, and other large works that are very symphony-like. Um, 
uh, that uh, to this day almost all of them are in the, the orchestral repertory. Uh, he was also one of the most important early conductors um, who established what my career would become uh, and, and a very, very influential opera conductor and interpreter of operas and opera performance. Um, what not a lot of people realize is between 1909 and 1911, uh, he was brought over to be music director of the New York Philharmonic. The New York Philharmonic was actually in, in, in a very difficult spot financially at the time. They had a new board, uh, they were under new management, and they wanted to bring over some hotshot European composer to inject a new, new life into the orchestra. And they paid a king's ransom to get Mahler to come over here and basically had to pay him so much he couldn't refuse it. Uh, so between 1909 and 1911, Mahler took up the post of the New York Philharmonic and instituted a lot of changes during that time. And one of those changes was no clapping between movements. <laughs> um, and this comes up all the time, of course, in performance. I can't tell you. There's always a large segment of my audience that um, would love to get uh, the other portion of the audience to just be quiet. <laughs> and this whole idea about performance practice uh, or audience etiquette, I should say, of the 20th century that now we consider to be standard. Um, this all started with Mahler. And uh, or it didn't begin with Mahler, but that's where it became the norm. Um, yeah, yeah. So let's talk about um, clapping. Mm -hmm. Hold on just a moment. I Hello think. there. Hold the chair. Uh, just a moment. Aren't we all muted? Okay, now we are. <laughs> so good. All right, so. Um, Let's talk about clapping in performance for a bit, because it's actually, the, there's some pretty funny events that happen throughout history that we'll talk about. And it, a good place to begin is with Jean Dorat, who is a poet and playwright in the 16th century. Uh, what this playwright did, uh, he would start to buy up tickets to his performances and hand them out uh, to people for free if they would promise to clap at opportune moments in his performances. So he was, you know, carefully placing audience members around who were being bribed, more or less, to become clappers, professional clappers. Uh, this became more and more popular. This idea kind of caught on. And by the early 19th century, uh, by 1820, in fact, uh, it became very popular in Paris, and I'll explain how. Now, in Mozart and Beethoven's time, they absolutely expected there to be all kinds of noise. I mean, many symphonies and other works, divertimenti in particular, were written to be, you know, entertainment for other events going on. Um, there'd be festivals or dinner, dinners or marriages or whatever. Um, so they expected there to be um, noise, people eating, talking, and um, certainly, they would expect applause between movements of symphonies. And uh, there are stories of Beethoven actually having to repeat movements of a symphony. I think the seventh, the first movement of the seventh has happened with, during one of the performances, there was so much applause uh, and they wouldn't stop until he repeated the first movement. So they heard it twice before they were able even to continue the work. Um, Beethoven would have considered uh, his symphonies a failure, perhaps, if he hadn't had um, more applause in between them. So that was the norm of the time. Uh, this is a, a sketch from 1842 called Le Claqueur, who was a, a professional clapper in Paris. Uh, now this started um, uh, in catching on in France in the late uh, 17th, uh, late 18th and early 19th century, and by 1820 there was actually an agency, uh, the Paris Claqueur Agency, that would hire out professional clappers for your audience. And it wasn't that much different than having a, you know, a professional studio audience of clappers or members of the studio audience now in uh, television shows that would be there to keep the audience alive <laughs> and excited about what was going on and engaged in, in the theater. Um, now, one of the first examples of a composer trying to put a stop to all of this clapping uh, was actually Felix Mendelssohn. In 1842, at the premiere of his um, 
third symphony, he'd actually written in the score that there should be silence between the movements, you know, that he too was thinking of these as a holistic work from beginning to end in much the same way that Beethoven was. And he wanted that whole thing to, to pr uh, proceed in an uninterrupted fashion. Wagner, likewise, um, you know, with his operas. I mean, any of you, any of you that go to a, a Verdi or Rossini or Mozart or a Puccini opera um, have become very used to every time an aria ends, everyone's clapping for the aria. And everything that's going on stage is if somebody pushes the pause button and they're all just standing still and waiting patiently until the applause finally dies down, but they don't break character, of course. And then once the applause dies down, they move on with the opera. And that was more or less the norm. Um, but Wagner did feel like this broke up the narrative. This is why many people consider Wagner to be uh, Wagner's opera, especially the Ring Cycle, to be kind of proto-cinema. This idea of this whole art form, even though it was going on for four and five hours at a time, that it was meant to be an unbroken narrative. Um, this is a sketch that was done of Mahler in his early comp uh, in his composing days in New York. Um, he, he was considered to be something of a taskmaster. Um, but this idea of silence between the movements finally caught on and it was mandated during his uh, music directorship of only two years with the New York Philharmonic. He actually died in 1911, um, a few months after that season. Um, but yeah, this so caught on that this became the norm throughout the United States especially. Um, and these days, um, it, you know, it's become something of a debate about whether or not it's okay to clap between movements. Um, I do understand, uh, certainly, I mean, I, uh, as a musician myself and a performer, it took me a long time to get used to the idea of people clapping because I'm um, very traditional. As many classical musicians are, we study the past and we think, you know, the way that we've been performing all our lives is the way it should be. However, the idea that we should stamp out people's enthusiasm in the hall is, is perhaps a dangerous one. Uh, so anytime people um, uh, uh, suggest that, that we should maybe try and, and enforce a little more silence between the movements, I have to say that I don't really want to do that. Uh, because if anything, we're trying to build our audiences. We're trying to cultivate our audiences and bring in people who may not be used to what we're doing. And the last thing we want to do is not make them feel at home. Uh, so. If people are enthusiastic and they want to show that enthusiasm in, in performance a little bit, I'm okay with it. Moving on uh, to our last section today, we're going to talk about recorded sound and the burgeoning of recorded sound, which um, didn't actually start with Thomas Edison. Uh, there was an, a few earlier examples of this, the idea of recording any kind of sound and reproducing it. Um, for the real beginnings of this idea, um, we have to go back uh, at least to the 16th century. Um, uh, there are examples, actually no, the 9th century even, now that I think about it. Um, there are examples of early music boxes in uh, the Middle East in the 9th century where they were already making some kind of a, a turning mechanism, whether it's a barrel or a wheel like this, that would cause bells to be struck. Um, usually with a, a wheel on the side that you would turn. And something of a, a rotating mechanism like this uh, with barrel organs. Now, I couldn't find any picture or sketches of a barrel organ from the 19th century. But it's the same idea of you know, a Viennese barrel organ. You're cranking the side, and it's basically just some kind of a roll that turns. And um, a mechanism inside causes different pipes to blow. Um, so this was going on for a long time, and this is basically recording a performance for posterity and for, for future reproduction. Another example of this idea, of course, would be the player piano. Um, we actually have, uh, so this is a, a Steinway from 1917, a player piano. Just as in prior eras, um, uh, composers and music lovers and publishers wanted to be able to reproduce performances, uh, great performances by great performers or composers. We have uh, early piano rolls of, of from the early 20th century of 
Rachmaninoff and Gershwin and Mahler playing their own works on piano roll. So we can actually hear rubato. We can hear how they're speeding up and slowing down music and how much time would they take for this transition. We can hear the actual style of play uh, in which they would perform. What we don't have, though, is um, differences in volume. We don't have dynamics. Uh, this mechanism could only control rhythm and speed of notes, but it couldn't, uh, they, they never found a way to accurately reproduce loud and soft sounds. So when you listen to a piano roll, there's no dynamics. Everything is basically, you know, on or off, and notes either begin or end, uh, but you don't hear a lot of variation in that. Now, the first recordings in the traditional sense, uh, the earliest recording device, actually goes back to this French gentleman, uh, Edouard Léon Scott de Martinville in 1853 in his phonautograph. And they're actually reproductions of what these early recordings sounded like. And I'm going to show this to you. It's completely fascinating. Uh, where, here it is. So you watch the first minute or so of this. It's fascinating. C'était un matin, dans les journaux de Paris, c'était sur le papier gris, l'on entendait une... Now, this, what you're hearing now, is what was reproduced in 2008 uh, using computers uh, that have imaged these uh, paper rolls that were made. So the sound we're getting out of this is much better than he would have actually heard in 1853. Um, so I'll, I'll bring it back a little bit. So what you're hearing now is a reproduction of what those rolls, they did record these sounds, even though he couldn't re reproduce those sounds back then. But it still is fascinating that we can hear so clearly the man who's singing this uh, French folk song in the middle of the 19th century. Uh, that, that sound was recorded forever using his phonautograph. In a moment, after you hear this reproduction, you'll hear, you'll see a little, uh, a little arm go down onto one of the wax cylinders, and you'll actually hear what the reproduction sounded like back then. C'est moi qui ai juré de délivrer la France et protéger sa liberté. Sa liberté. So their ability at reproducing sound uh, still left a lot to be desired, unfortunately, but they were still recording sound for the first time for later use. They were recording an actual sound event that would live forever. Now the first uh, examples of a phonograph uh, that caught on from Thomas Edison uh, was around 1878. Uh, and there were many different versions of this, of Thomas Edison's phonograph. Um, and this also kind of caught on with wildfire. Everyone was, was completely enamored of the idea of recording their own voice. And what we actually have are some early examples of composers having a little fun with this. This first one is Johannes Brahms, and you'll actually hear Johannes Brahms' voice in the very beginning. I believe this is from 1889. Um, and you'll hear Brahms's voice very briefly in the beginning, just saying, uh, Ich bin Herr Brahms, um, I am Brahms, I am Dr. Brahms. He'd received a, an honorary doctorate from, the, from Oxford. And you hear him say, I am Dr. Johannes Brahms. And then he plays some music, but it, the sound quality is so bad, you can't even tell he's playing piano. So that it almost sounds like a dog barking, but that actually is, is Brahms playing the piano. Um, this next little recording is 
Tchaikovsky and Anton Rubinstein. And I've done some work to try and find, because it's all in Russian, trying to find out what exactly were they doing. So what you hear is Pyotr Tchaikovsky singing, and I am convinced that vodka was involved in this one. Uh, but you hear uh, Tchaikovsky singing and fooling around and doing a trill. And then Anton uh, Rubinstein says something like, that's not the way you trill. And then there's a soprano there as well who actually sings a proper trill. Sounds to me like a party at the Hopley's house. So <laughs> the next <laughs> recording you'll see. Now, uh, this is actually um, a silent film of Saint-Saëns uh, conducting. Now, what he's conducting, this is a silent film. It has nothing to do with the music that's being played. They just happen to play some music um, uh, linked up with this silent film. But I wanted to show it just because it's really fun to see Saint-Saëns himself conducting. And then what will follow uh, is a brief um, performance of uh, Sasson himself playing piano, and it's actually of surprisingly good quality. You see how long that baton is? It's t about twice as long as a modern baton, but that wasn't uncommon in the late 19th century. So, uh, you may be asking, when was the first orchestral performance recorded? Well, it was only a few years uh, later, not too long. Uh, the first full performance recorded of any work was, of course, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And I figured this is the perfect place for us to end. Uh, so, this uh, recording um, was... Uh, who was the conductor? Uh, his name was Kark. Uh, and actually, I do have an image of this gentleman which is right here. This is Friedrich Kark. Here he is conducting a band. This is not the Odeon Symphony, um, but many of the same members of this group were in the Odeon Symphony in Berlin in 1910. And this is Friedrich Kark, their conductor. And this is the first ever recorded performance of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Now, this is a professional orchestra, but you can listen carefully. Despite the quality of the recording itself, you can tell that also the caliber of the performance then left a fair amount to be desired. You know, the, the winds are, are not terribly well in tune, the strings are sliding around and not always together. Phrases end and begin at different times, they're not actually lined up. You know, the level of performance um, wasn't quite to um, modern standards. And I would argue that one of the reasons standards have gotten so incredibly high over the late 20th century and, and since is because of the recording industry. Because of the recording industry, um, once you committed something to a recording, it was forever. So this idea of a performance had to be perfect um, really did catch on by the mid-20th century. Mm -hmm.
quickly the tempo changes from fast to slow throughout that performance. Um, now, three years later, the Berlin Philharmonic here, uh, this, there was their conductor, Arthur Nikisch, uh, recorded the same work. So among the very first recordings were multiple recordings of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. To this day, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is the most recorded work in history. Uh, and here is actually a recording of the Berlin Phil or uh, an image of Arthur Nikisch and the Berlin Philharmonic from these recording sessions in 1913. A lot of great mustaches in there. And then here we are. was the best orchestra in Europe. And that, c'est fini. <laughs> so, my friends, any other questions that we have about all of this, about recording, <coughs> clapping, or anything else? Yes. Yes. What do we got? Uh, um, this is not exactly a question, but it's um, an idea that I've been thinking about a long time having to do with recording. Mm -hmm. um, I had a friend living with me for a while who had a pretty decent um, old fashioned, um, you know, a turntable and some vinyl. And I'm, my hearing is not good. I'm losing my hearing. I wear hearing aids already. Um, but when this vinyl was playing, whatever it was, it didn't matter if it was classical or pop or whatever, I would whatever room in this small condo that I was in, I would have to go in and listen because it grabbed me in a way that digital CDs don't grab me. So I wonder, you know, if you've ever noticed a difference between the visceral experience of listening to vinyl versus listening to um, digital. Yeah, there, there is um, this debate is, uh, is still raging about the benefits of, um, uh, or about the, the oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Mm. The, relative the, quality? Yeah, the relative quality and the okay. attributes of digital reproduction versus, um, you know, actual, um, you know, recordings of sound waves um, that are not digitally altered in any way as would be with uh, an LP. Um, I just bought, I, I've been collecting LPs since uh, my early teens, and I just bought a new record player about a week ago. Uh, so, I mean, I listen to them all the time, and, I've, and mm -hmm. I love to collect old recordings. The older, the better. It's one of the ways I do historical performance research throughout the 20th century and hear how performance practices changed. Now, I will say this. Um, I do think that a lot of the reasons, this is my own opinion, but one of the reasons why I think we are so enamored of the sound and we're so attracted to the sound of LPs is because it's the sound of our youth. And the first time we heard the Beatles, the first time we heard uh, the Doors, or the first time we heard Beethoven, 
or Grieg or Rachmaninoff was probably with an LP. Um, the other thing you will notice with an LP is that there's, uh, there's, a, there's an underground current that you can hear. Now, a lot of people who are diehard LP listeners, um, some will spend hundreds if not thousands of dollars on their players. Um, there is a background sound of the ground that's going through it, the electrical ground. So there's a little bit of a hum. And most people, most scientists, if you ask them, who have analyzed the difference between digital recordings and those recordings, said that it's that underground hum that's going in the music that gives a, a general feeling of warmth of sound. Huh. Wow. And what we found is when they took that warmth and they applied it to CDs, people didn't know the difference. And they thought, oh, that's it. That's the sound I like. And it's because subconsciously <laughs> that's what they're attracted to. It's this, this warmth of sound that's, that's created by this undercurrent, this low frequency, quiet rumble that's going on with LPs. Wow. Yeah. Now, the, well, the reality is um, CDs and, and especially high definition CDs are capturing it music at such a ridiculously high frequency. I mean, there is nothing that can compare to that high level of, of sound reproduction. I mean, no LP can, can get a full stereophonic reproduction um, of, of that level with, you know, I mean, to get, take a, a giant work like a Mahler symphony with a hundred performers or several hundred performers. I don't think an LP is capable of reproducing that sound to anywhere near the level that you get with a modern digital recording. Um, it, it wasn't designed to handle that kind of uh, volume and that huh. volume differential either. Um, so it, I still adore uh, collecting and listening to records, um, but mm -hmm. it, most of the listening I do though is digital. Uh, because I'm able to get, I'm able to hear the quality of the instruments so much better. I can hear a transparency of the ensemble, um, and it nothing else gets as close to what it sounds like being on stage and actually hearing the musicians right in front of you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, because I, I, in my theory, I try to differentiate between us being analog versus robotic. Right. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Or analog versus digital. You're absolutely right. 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 Anyway, thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah. Any other questions, friends? See you next week. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm not sure what we're doing next week. This is the last one that I'd scheduled, but we'll come up with something. Um <laughs> next Monday for the orchestra, we might do another symphonic bingo night or something. Um and I, I have decided that I'm gonna do a third chapter of this. Um, originally, we were going to continue into the 20th century with this part two, but it just got too long. I mean, we're, we're two hours in at this point now um, with having taken a break. Um, so I think we will do a third chapter on this and we'll cover some, some great turning points in the 20th century uh, that will be fun and maybe introduce you to some ideas about 20th century music because we have there's a lot of controversy about what music even means in the 20th century and maybe we'll tackle some of those ideas too and that should be fun cool that all right would be everyone super thank you take care be safe wash your hands yep. all that good stuff thank you yep. we'll see you when we see you yeah. <laughs> bye, bye bye thanks okay. michael bye bye, bye. thank you Bye-bye. Do a quit. Thanks.